Mona, we're out here in a park by the airport, and this is where you live. Correct. Tell me about it. Um, well, I came here via Santa Monica, I guess is where I first was at before I came here. Um, I've been here for about five or six months, no, five months. Um, and it was funny because we came here, we just knew the park was here, we didn't know anything about it, but it turned out the day we were got here, we learned it was a safe zone just during the time of the virus, which means you could be here at night without being uh, persecuted. So uh, we decided we would stay here for a while. And we've been here for about five or six months now. Um, and it is, I guess, a safe zone in general. How did you end up homeless? Um, well, on December 4th, 2017, uh, my house burned down is part of the Thomas fire, which at that time was the largest wildfire in California state history. It was in Ventura County. I lived in the upper Ojai on the edge of the forest. And they saved the town, homes down in Ventura, the city. So everything in the upper Ojai kind of burned down and hundreds of people were homeless like instantly overnight. And you also lost your job. I lost my job that same day. I worked from home. Um, making phone calls for an insurance adjuster. I made $25 an hour uh, doing phone calls about four hours a day, setting up a schedule of appointments for him and then faxing it to him or whatever. And uh, it was great. My dog could be right there with me when I was working. I didn't have to drive anywhere. And then um, when the fire happened, I no longer had the home office to work at. So I kind of told him I had something at my mom's house, which wasn't true, but I wanted to keep the job. Right. And uh, I think he kind of knew that couldn't be right or something because he never really, I sent him that last invoice, which was dated like the day before the fire. And then I never had another project with him after that. He never said why exactly, but I think it had something to do with the lack of home office to make the phone calls in. Now you're a college graduate. Uh, yeah, no, I'm a college graduate. I have a bachelor's of science in mathematics. Um, as well as nearly a master's of science in mathematics. I finished almost but all but two classes, but I left there, I went to Berkeley to get my master's of science in industrial engineering and operations research and a certificate in logistics. And so uh, here you are with uh, masters and bachelors and you're living in a park. That's true. Um, I mean, the initial thing behind that was the fire, but um, then there was a housing crunch that goes along with having a fire. And just all these different factors led into it being longer and longer of me being homeless. It'd been a while since I had worked um, in my field of statistics. Uh, I used to work in electricity research, doing uh, building efficiency research. Um, I've published eight journal articles. I had stopped doing that for about 10 years. That's where my real training is at. But um, You said a statistician. Yeah, statistician, like statistician. Uh, statistics, data analysis, yeah. that kind of thing. So uh, I worked ma mainly for uh, the California Public Utilities Commission, the California Energy Commission, Southern California Edison. Um, we did the first study of its type in the world to estimate the amount of electricity consumed by outdoor lighting in <laughs> California. And they made Title 24 energy code modifications based on yeah. our study. Yeah. So is anybody helping you? Um, not that much. I mean, I think part of the problem is navigating the system and determining how to um, get the help. Because, I mean, they come around here and they give us these weird lunches that some people eat. I don't really like them. I'm kind of picky eater. But, um, and, and that, but to actually get yourself, like, helped into a place. Because I don't see how you can really work like get a job and be a productive member of society living in the park. I mean, how do you get showered for the job interview and your suit on and there on time? And, you know, it's just too many factors that could go wrong. So you have to be inside, I believe, till you can really like work and become productive. So I don't remember what you asked me that got me started. Because <laughs> we talked about it earlier. Is anybody helping you? Our oh, service? yeah. Um, I think there are some services out there, but navigating the system to find them and get connected with them is a whole other story. Um, so nobody's really helping me right now. I mean, I get some food stamps and uh, general relief from the I was going to ask, that, how, do, how do you survive? So you're getting GR, and for those that don't know, that's like 200 a month. 225 maybe Yeah, a 200 month. and something like that. Yeah. And you get food stamps. Which luckily just increased about $50, oh, so that's great. great yeah. Um, but out here, it's hard You can't to keep food. You know, oh, yeah, no, food. I waste so much food just from buying it. Because I refuse to only eat non 
I mean, I need things that, yeah, they're going to go bad, like cheese. I survive on cheese. So, you know, it's a lot of times I have to throw it away because yeah. I didn't have a refrigeration. And right. we can't cook any hot food ever. Like, that's one thing that's really lucky. Yeah. The, um, when you said hard to navigate social services, I mean, there's people coming out here and explain the navigate part. I mean, because we talked about it a little bit earlier, and I'm sure there's outreach that comes out here, but they're just, you said, overloaded. That's part of it, is that there's so many people for them to help, and they're probably short-staffed at their organizations, because they probably don't pay that much. And so to, you know, they have a hundred people they're trying to help, that one person doesn't, you, things slip through their mind, they lose track of what everybody needs. So they can't, you know what I mean, they're overworked, but the other part of navigating the system is in order to get placed with a voucher, let's say, a housing voucher, you have to be referred through this CES system and this like scoring uh, key that they have. So a lot of people don't understand that or what that means. They've never even filled out the survey to get the score, so they're never going to change their housing right. situation. And, and you're talking, so it's the coordinated entry. Yeah, the CES survey. And then survey. they have different ways of... Uh, Linking the you survey up. that you're talking about is to see how vulnerable you are, to right. see if you're worthy of help, the worthy poor and unworthy. Well, poor. what they do is they um, go down the list in descending order of scores. So the higher your score, the more crucial it is, I guess, for you to get inside. Right. And so therefore, those are the people they award the matches to first. But see, I understand that because I think we have a... There's no uh, favoritism that way. Yeah, well, I think we need, you know, people that are closer to death, we need to help. But also, like you, if you were in housing, if they came and housed you, in a year or so, you, you would be able to restabilize. You exactly. would heal, and then you would go back into society you get, i mean you're right. a college graduate exactly. but if they wait until you're vulnerable that means that social services is going to be taking care of you for the rest of your life well luckily for me i've had some fairly intense well, not luckily for me i've had some fairly intense trauma in my past things that are like unheard of like almost out of this world kind of thing yeah. so i actually uh because of my mental health status i do rate a fairly high score Okay. Um, and I did meet an outreach worker the other day who told me he thinks he can raise my score two or three points and I'm wow. getting in touch with him to make that happen. Yeah. yeah. It's just so sad that they have to prioritize people like that. It should be... Well, you know, here's the thing that used to happen before this system was in place. I believe in the system, the CES system actually, because before that, they would call up the local housing shelter of their town, like Santa yeah. Monica, would call up one in Santa Monica and say, hey, we've got 30 vouchers. And the lady there's going to hand them out to the people she likes. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so if she doesn't like you, you're kind of effed and you're never going to get anything happening. Yeah. Whereas with the CES system, it's objective. Anybody can verify your scoring as well as, you know, they can yeah. say this is the order in which we contacted people. Well, CES is a good idea. The problem, one of the problems is all nonprofits aren't equal. Right. So they all don't get the, um, uh, the support so being able to route you to the services that you need or the housing and then the other issue is there's lack of housing yeah that's i think one of the main issues is just the overall lack of actual housing units yeah. uh, to go through the population so i just read this interesting thing today that in the 2000s for every one housing unit that was built there was an increase in population in la of two people so it's half the rate now nowadays for every one housing unit built, it's four new people in LA or whatever. So basically you're, they're building about one fourth of the percentage of what they need. Yeah. You know what I mean? Or one per fourth of the total. Well, I, I don't know what the statistics are. Um, you know, that that's your expertise, <laughs> right? What I do know is that Los Angeles is really good at building luxury housing and really bad at building low income housing. Yeah. So you're talking about trauma. I, most homeless people out here have experienced some kind of trauma. That's true. Um, I mean, just being out here, you're exposed all the time, 24-7, yeah. and eventually you're going to come across something bad. Actually, my trauma happened indoors. Uh, right. I made the wrong people pissed off, and, and, and I went through a lot. I'm not, not going to get into this particular No, story, no I, I'm not. I'm just... <laughs> no, I know you're not. Yeah, yeah. The, Everybody I, has it, though. Most homeless people have yeah. gone through it. 
the, the trauma caused them here and then being here is more trauma. More trauma. Yeah. Um, some people's traumas are way more extreme than others, I've noticed. Like some people, what they call trauma, I'm like, oh my God, that's a walk in the park yeah. or whatever. But, you know, it's trauma, traumatic different. for them, exactly. Yeah, so exactly. We have, to, we have to accept that that's their reality. If you had three wishes, what would they be? Um, to be back inside in a house where I can shower every day, wash my clothes, comb my hair, you know, just be having good hygiene practices and stuff, I, to be inside for that, and to cook, and um, so that's one wish. I wish I could go back to my former career of data analyst for electricity research, because I really did love that job, and whatever the facts are that I was good at it too, I just, getting back to it seems almost insurmountable at this time. Yeah. I'm sure it's not, once I, you know, once I'm inside, then it's that much easier, but this point in time it's too much and the third wish would be a dog I want a dog I had a dog when the fire happened and then it came down to just being me and the dog for a long time and then the dog died on June 2019 uh, which was terrible and I'm so sorry. I really wish I had a dog with me right now to travel my path a little one white poodle mix or something <laughs> poodle mix <laughs> great wishes well thank you very much for talking to me thank you for your time Mark and for considering me Mm-hmm. <laughs>